this will be the next firm that I tackle in this uh, <laughs> this home project of mine. This is the breezeway. It's not a living space. It's more of an outdoor, indoor area. Kind of a four season, three season porch. Um, I mentioned this earlier that uh, this is all coming out as well as this here. Um, it'll be a while before I get to this. Probably around springtime. But because it's winter and uh, we've just got our first, well, second dusting of snow so far. It's, you know, we're in late December and uh, we're going to be getting some snow. Had to make sure that that snowblower of mine is up to the challenge. So if you saw my video on the 97 Murray snowblower, well, this video is for you. We're going to take a look at how the project came and how, or what, uh, what I did to it um, to make sure that it's ready to tackle, you know, a New England snowstorm. Let's take a look. So just as a recap, when we left off, we had the, uh, I bought this used 1997 Murray snowblower. It was a small, like a 22 inch, uh, three, a two stage with a five horse to come some motor on it. And upon, ver uh, upon my initial inspection, it looked like it needed a drive wheel. And I decided to repack the grease on the, um, on the auger gearbox. So I ordered the parts, they all came in. And uh, let's take a look. I went a little bit further than I was going to on this one. I actually, I, I think I outdid myself. Um, I, I made this snowboarder looks brand new. It's a 97 Murray. It uh, had a five horse engine. Um, you know, sm the smallest snowblower that I could find that was a two stage. But when you see it now, you won't even recognize it. I, I really, I, I gotta say, I put a lot of work into this machine, um, more than I probably should have. Let's take a look. Amazing, amazing transformation. It's amazing what a little bit of paint can do to a machine. Um, you remember it had the gear selector down here? Well, I moved it up here to be more convenient. Um, I even added this really nice 3D shoot control. And remember that uh, little five horse Tecumseh motor? I made a few performance modifications and I brought it up to eight horsepower. Um, and the wheels that were too small for the unit are too big. Well, I made some adjustments to the chassis to make it sit level again. Outdid myself. Really, really did. Um, I even added these Toro badges to fool you into thinking that it's a different machine. But I swear to God, hand to God, this is a 97 Murray with some performance modifications. It's got, um, <clears throat> yeah, nice, uh, nice upgrades. No, no more bullshitting. Um, this is a new machine, clearly. And if I fooled you, Oh boy, might want to get that checked out. Here's what really happened. So I started working on the 97 Murray snowblower and it wasn't very long before I realized I was beating a dead horse. Anything's fixable with unlimited piles of cash and unlimited time and patience. But there comes a time when you just have to say, you know what, screw this. I'm just going to buy a new machine and maintain it and get 20 years out of it. Hopefully. We'll see. Probably not going to happen. But, <clears throat> with all due respect, that 97 Murray was one of the cheapest built machines I had ever seen in my life as I started tearing into it. And it lasted 20 years. This is built worlds better than that thing ever was. So as I was, I did successfully replace the drive wheel or the rubber, um, the rubber uh, wheel um, drive disc, drive wheel. The disc is what it rides on. Anyway, I replaced that and it made um, major improvements to its mobility. I did the auger, I tore the auger uh, gearbox apart. Well, just for reference, the gearbox in the auger is, uh, is that little thing right there, that little box. 
is a worm gear that rides on a, uh, on, a on a standard straight cut or a helical cut gear and <clears throat> tore it apart. Actually, it was in pretty good shape. I cleaned it out. I put new grease in, packed new grease in there. And uh, I started working on the motor, the five horse to come, so motor. And I discovered, I, I kind of suspected this, but I knew it had a bad head gasket. Um, because there was, uh, you can't really tell on an engine like this one, but around the cylinder head, see this right here, this little seam? That's where the head gasket is. Now, that was a flathead engine, so the valves were inside the block rather than on top. But anyway, the the cylinder head gasket was leaking. There was black carbon on, on one side of it, which is a clear indication that there's a leak. So I'm like, well, okay, no big deal. They're easy to replace, and I'm, I can easily get parts for it. So I started tearing. Oh, and it had a leaking fuel line, so you could kill two stones with one bird, tear the head off, replace the fuel line, because you got to take the shroud up. This engine shroud has to come off to do that. So I started uh, doing that, and I, I, cr I broke a head bolt off. I'm like, well, shit. <laughs> this is off to a good start. Um, broken head bolt in an aluminum engine. Just bad news bears. Um, not something I want to mess with. Uh, especially something that old and, 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 and just worn out. Um, it didn't have good compression to begin with. They attributed that to a possible blown head gasket. It had like 55 pounds. I mean, that's not great. That's actually quite terrible. It'll run. Yeah, but for how long? So I'm like, all right, I got to extract a head bolt. I've got to put a head gasket on it. I've got to replace a fuel line, which I had on hand. I, I already replaced the fuel line. I'm like, what next? What what next are you going to throw at me, you piece of shit? So I, um, I took the carburetor bowl off. And for those of you who want to know what that is, let's see if I can show you this one. Carburetor bowl is this thing right here with that those two bolts sticking out of it. That is the carburetor bowl. That's where the fuel collects, where it's, it's basically a small chamber with a float. And that float blocks off the fuel port coming in from the tank when it fills up and then when it goes down it opens up the valve and fuel flows and it's to keep the fuel at the ready so the jets can suck it up and, and send it into the venturi the hold and the carburetor tube anyway so the carburetor was car was just corroded to hell so I could have put a Harbor Freight motor on it and just be done with it. But I was looking at the rest of the machine, and I remember when I had the gearbox all torn apart, um, the drivetrain, it was all kind of worn out. There was a lot of slop in the chain. So, okay, let's, you know, we'll put a new chain on it. I mean, it just, it never ends. And it's a machine that you need at the ready when you need it, not when it's ready to be used. So I made the decision. It was a hard decision to make because I've been spending a lot of money on this house, as you will soon see um, throughout this video series. Uh, but I've been spending a lot of money on this house, and I didn't want to spend another 800 bucks on a, on a snowblower that I'm going to use really not that much. I don't have a lot of land, and I have a small driveway. But it is New England. We get a shitload of snow. <laughs> and when it snows, it snows. So, I bought this, and you know, it's going to last me as long as I can make it last. So let's talk about this machine, and uh, we'll, we'll, tell, we'll talk, you, talk a little bit about why I chose this one over all the others. Um, Toro makes fantastic equipment, and they make their own equipment. They are not, like all of the other ones, great brands that are now under the umbrella of MTD, um, like Cub Cadet. Um, uh, I believe, uh, let's see, Snapper's now owned by Briggs, and Honda's still Honda. Arians is still Arians, and Toro's still Toro. But MTD makes Cub Cadet, they make Craftsman, they make, um, oh, there's a ton of other brands that they took over. I can't think of them all. But Cub Cadet's one of the biggest ones. Um, and it turns out Husqvarna, I believe, is still owned by Husqvarna, so they're not making that. 
anyway. MTD does make some stuff for Toro. They make their low-end garden tractors, but that's all they do for Toro. But anyway, this is a, a fantastically built machine. It was one of the best built on the line at Home Depot that they had. Um, yes, I bought it at Home Depot knowing full well that you're better off buying from a dealer, and I'll show you one of the reasons why I know that. Um, actually, I know a guy who works for a dealer, and I should have bought it from him, but I was in a hurry, and I had a gift card for Home Depot that I wanted to use up. So, the Toro had uh, one of the best built chassis that I could see. You know, when you lift up, on most snowblowers, most MTD products anyway, and, and oh, Troy built, that was another one MTD builds, uh, is Troy built. You put some pressure down on this handle here, and on most snow throwers, the entire chassis flexes sideways, and the Toro does not. The Toro is a solid built machine. Um, and it's partly because of their chute design, which required, in fact, they, they had been doing this before they made this chute, but they have outriggers welded from this part of the, uh, the, the chassis to the blower housing and kind of angles in or angles out and on both sides. And um, it's fully boxed in. If you look at the blower housing, or the chute, uh, the blower housing, it's fully boxed in. It's not open, but it allows for um, this snow recycler housing to be incorporated into the design. Um, what it does is it's blowing snow out through the chute like that, but any snow that doesn't make it out the chute is directed back into the uh, uh, back into the blower through this channel here. And it directs it back in where it gets once again sent. If it, and if it doesn't make it that pass, it keeps going. Um, it reduces clogs, and this design's been out for several years now, and it's it's been highly regarded by everyone I've, or every review that I've read, except for very few. Um, another thing that makes Toro kind of stand out from the crowd, and this at first caught me off guard, like, this is, like, are they serious? Um, <laughs> they don't use shear pins. There are no shear pins in the auger. And how they're able to, see those bolts right there? In most snowblowers, those bolts act as a mechanical fuse in the form of a shear pin. It's a low-grade metal bolt that um, when the auger is over, or uh, um, something gets lodged into the auger, like a rock or a small pet, it will actually shear the bolt so that the machine is allowed to continue um, running without any mechanical damage such as a broken uh, gearbox or what have you. Toro's design takes a different approach altogether. They beef up their their uh, their drive lines so that if something were to get stuck in the auger, it would either chew it up or stall the motor. And they do that by building one of the best auger gearboxes in the industry. It is um, all hardened steel gears and it's oil lubricated. All the other snow blowers that I found, all the MTD products, are basically um, sealed units and they're packed with grease. And, uh, and I believe they use brass gears that wear out, but not Toro. Toro's like, no, we can do better than that. And the other thing is the auger is supported by, these appear to be aluminum uh, bearings. They're not, they're, they're probably, um, they're probably bushings, like copper or, or bronze bushings in there. But those are made out of actual metal. Um, the Murray that I was working on, they were made of plastic. And that was made back in 97. Now, speaking of plastic, so... This is actually the first year for this exact model. Um, its predecessor, the 824, it was a, the SKU number was one number different. Um, but anyway, the predecessor had a plastic chute and a plastic blower housing. This was another issue that I, I, I took issue with this, and before I bought the machine, I, I did some homework. Turns out the plastic chutes were actually better because they were lightweight. They never broke, and um, they went to a metal chute 
because of customer demand, all of the competing, competing products in this price range have uh, steel shoots. And customers are born and bred to believe that in every instance, metal is always better. Sometimes in snowblowers especially, metal isn't always the best material because it tends to rust over time. And a rusting chute doesn't move a lot of snow. I know this from experience. Plastic chutes, on the other hand, they never rust. They're always slick. Snow always flies out of them. But because consumers demanded metal chutes, here we go. It's a nice chute. I mean, believe me, it moves very nicely, and I'm impressed with it, actually. But I'm going to have to make sure that I spray it with silicone or whatever to keep it from clogging. The blower housing is plastic, and in early production years, um, they were having issues with cracking. Um, apparently, they have changed the formula. You see, plastic is a wonderful material because it can be molded in many different shapes. And you kind of have to make this out of plastic to keep the cost at a reasonable level. If this were made out of metal, it would have cost substantially more money to buy. Um, but anyway, these aren't supposed to be having any cracking issues because of the formula changes in the plastics and uh, you know, just the, the progression of engineering as it goes along. And that's, uh, <clears throat> that is kind of what makes this machine one of the, one of its top, one of the top of its, uh, of its, of its price range. The anti-clogging system. But anyway, another Toro feature that I like is the shoot control. Now I looked at I looked at some. There was a Husqvarna that was actually less money and it had heated hand grips, but it, again it felt kind of like a wet noodle, uh, very flimsy, very very um, very heavy actually. It was it was heavier than this one, but the shoot control was was done by two levers, X axis. No, actually one of them was rotate. The other one was the shoot up down. This design I love um, and I, I looked at all of the snowblowers again and I, the worst ones were the um, the MTD products the, the uh, especially the um, the craftsmans and the Troy builds they had a very weak very so it had it still had a crank down here to rotate the chute and it had this cheap plasticky lever right here to control the um, the shoot angle and I'm like that just feels kind of chintzy um, this one it's smoothless smoothless it's <laughs> what was I trying to say it's smooth and seamless it's intuitive it, it just it works so nice for how long I don't know I mean you know it's a, it's a complicated design and it will probably break but it locks into position quite nicely and it's not likely to walk on its own but it's a very, very slick, very well thought out um, shoot control. And the gear selector on the on the Toro, it had the nicest feel to it. The um, the Husk Varnas, it was like you had to, it was like a lot of force to get it to move out of position and and to lock into whatever desired position you had. It was like it took a lot to get it to move. Um, Toro, not so much. It, 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 it just, it felt right. Um, and these nice plastic knobs are great for wearing gloves. You know, everything on this machine just screams well thought out and well engineered. And yes, there is plastic here and there, but modern plastics aren't what they used to be. They will discolor, but they shouldn't, they shouldn't break easily. And if they do, they are replaceable. So... The total out the door cost for this machine was eight fifty. Oh, and there's more. The engine. We all know, we all know that everything is using Chinese engine. Everyone is using Chinese engines now, and there's a reason for it. Um, but first, let's start this thing up, and we'll hear it run. And uh, I'm gonna open up my garage door so I don't, I don't uh, fumigate myself. Yes, my roofer is still. Oh God. But at least the main house is done. Let's fire this thing up. I um I, I actually primed it last night. I want to see. I have the fuel shut off here. I turn the fuel on, and I put it on Bunny Rabbit, and uh, let's see if it starts. I have it on. It's already on choke. Might have to prime it again. There we go.
That's remarkably fuel efficient. Anyway, <laughs> I want to see how long it took for it to kill when you shut the gas off. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so, where were they going with this? So anyway, they're all using Chinese motors these days. So here's the thing. American power equipment manufacturers like Toro, uh, MTD, Husqvarna, they are American, right? I think they are. But anyway. <laughs> they used to buy most of their engines from either Briggs & Stratton or Tecumseh. And for the premium equipment, Kohler or Kawasaki. Toro had a relationship with Kawasaki for a number of years. But the consumer stuff either got a Briggs or a Tecumseh. That was it for five decades. That's what you got. But some, some funny things happened. The Chinese came in with their power equipment motors. Oh, and Honda. Don't forget Honda. That was Honda was another premium engine choice on, on a lot of machines as well. But Toro used, I believe, mostly Tecumseh motors, especially on their snowblowers. Tecumseh went out of business. Um, their engines weren't that great, in my opinion. I never really had much luck with Tecumseh. I had, when I was a kid, any any real problems I ever had with, with, with small engines, it was always a Tecumseh motor. It was always a Tecumseh. And Briggs and Stratton, they were my favorite. But they got out of the snowblower engine business, um, what, in the 90s? And Tecumseh kind of took over. And then Tecumseh screwed up. Here's one example. My dad had a, um, he bought a brand new Arians 824 snowblower. And, and for snowblower model numbers, 824 means 8 horsepower, 24 inch cut. Um, <clears throat> so he had, or it was an 826 maybe, 26 inch. And we bought it brand new. We took really good care. I took care of it. I maintained it. And, um, you know, every season we would, we would um, you know, make sure it had stabilizer in the fuel. And, I mean, it was well cared for. Always had problems starting up. Um, we took, I took the carburetor apart. It was clean. It was just run too lean. And it was a piece of shit. Anyway, we sold that thing, got another one. We got a Chinese-engined uh, uh, Cub Cadet, and that one never had a problem starting. But anyway, I digress. Tor uh, Tecumseh went out of business and sold all their technology to, I believe, China bottom-up. You know, they're... they're, they're the rights to the name and parts and stuff. Briggs and Stratton is still alive and well. They were always my favorite. Uh, Briggs and Stratton is now in order because they see the writing on the wall. They know that the American built small engine business is kind of dwindling. Um, Honda's building a lot of their stuff now in um, in Taiwan or Thailand and China. And it's just the writing's on the wall. Kohler, I, need, I believe Kohler outsources some of their stuff now too, um, to offshore um, factories as well. Writing's on the wall, what are we gonna do? Well, why don't we buy up some uh, equipment manufacturers like Snapper and uh, I believe they own uh, Poland and we're going to just supply our own engines and build our own. We're going to do the whole the whole shebang up, you know, ground up. So they became suddenly a, we went from a supplier to a competitor to everybody. And, you know, for Briggs and Stratton's sake, I think that was a smart move. Um, we'll see how it pans out. But remember, Chinese power equipment manufacturers are now sending over entire machines, snowblowers and lawnmowers and what have you. So we'll see how this pans out. Meanwhile, companies like Toro, MTD, and the and the gamut, uh, they're like, well, we need engines and we are now a competitor to Briggs. Maybe we can do something a little better. So in the case of Toro, they went to an engine manufacturer in China called Lonsen. Now they make motorcycles and scooters and they make uh, stuff under contract for both Honda as well as BMW. And um, they're one of the more reputable Chinese engine makes. So they now are now buying their engines from Lonsen under an agreement. Toro supplies the parts and warranty to the consumer. And Lonsen cranks out the engines. Now, here's the thing with Chinese manufacturers. You can buy 
basically whatever you want from China. I mean, if you want a cheap engine that's designed to last two or three seasons, you can do that. If you want a, a, a quality engine that can last 20 years, they will provide that as well. Um, they're very dynamic. They can produce just about any quality level you want, including a quality that far exceeds anything that America's ever produced for small engines. They can do it. It's are you willing to pay for it? Toro has a, a reputation to keep, and if they started putting the, you know the Harbor Freight style engines on their on their machines, people would notice and they would probably stop buying them. Um, Harbor Freight, I think, buys a lower quality tier motor, but they're actually not bad engines. Um, I have had great luck. I actually, I have friends who've used them and they've had excellent luck with them. The Predators and the um, and the different other. I think Predators, their big engine uh, name. But I believe a lot of those engines are made by another Chinese company called um, Lin Hai. <clears throat> At least they used to be. I've done a lot of research on Chinese engines since I used to be in the scooter hobby, um, motor scooters. I was a Honda guy, but I also did try to keep tabs on who's making what um, in, in terms of uh, Chinese scooters and Chinese engines and GY6 clones. And I do know where their, where their trouble spots are, so I know what to look out for. Um, and we'll see if those trouble spots translate to this engine. But anyway, so what Toro did is it's basically the same. It's basically a Honda clone block with, um, you know, it's been evolutionized over the years. But the Chinese small engines all started out as Honda clones. And um, they were using expired patents and technologies that Honda created and uh, just kept making them. And um, they would modify them here and there to suit the emission standards and whatever needs the uh, the, the customer, like Toro, uh, had. Um, but this engine does seem pretty well put together overall. I mean, it is an overhead valve. It has an aluminum valve cover, which is the only, I think this is the only snowblower engine <laughs> that has an aluminum valve cover. Um, but it's pretty well put together. And I think that it's just gonna be a matter of you know, keeping it maintained and, and not letting it go to hell. You know, changing the oil, you know, on a regular basis, changing the spark plug when needed, and, and just keeping up on it. The, the biggest problem with Chinese engines, I'll, I'll tell you, it actually has more to do with the carburetors um, becoming corroded and the fuel and the, the, uh, the engine gaskets leaking. From my experience, um, and this is, this is with the lower tier Chinese engines, but the oil seals tend to gum up and they, they dissolve. Um, I think that uh, like most Honda GY6 clone engines have really cheap seals on them and they always go bad. Um, carburetors will corrode very easily if not taken care of. Um, and that may not be true. This may have you know better coatings on the carburetor bowl and, and, and it just might be just a better better materials, but only time will tell. The way I intend to take care of this machine is, is as follows. I'm going to change the oil every season. It's not going to get a lot of use um, between, you know, in, in the snowstorms we get are pretty, I mean, they're big, but they don't last. So I think I'm going to get, you know, one oil change a season out of it. I'm going to put stabilizer in the fuel. And, uh, you know, at the end of each season, I'm going to shut the fuel off. And just like I did now, I'm going to run it until it dies. And that'll keep the fuel out of the bowl. Um, you know, I'm just going to do that just to maintain it. Uh, the stabilizer will help coat the inside of the carburetor a little bit with something that'll prevent flash rust. And, uh, you know, change the belts when it needs it. But these tires should last a good long time. What kind of tires are they using? Are these? They're not Carlisle's, are they? I don't think so. They're, um, apparently they're no name. Nylon tubeless. Yeah, there's no there's no manufacturer on these tires. So they're not Carlisle's anymore. Those days are over. <laughs> but anyway, my new snowblower, the Craftsman or Craftsman, the, the Murray turned out to be a complete piece of crap. And this is gonna last, so I hope. Well, until then guys, have a great uh, happy new year. It's just being, uh, I thought today was going to be nicer, but 
my roofer. Oh, God damn it. I wonder when he'll finish. <laughs> the main house is watertight, but, you know, this side of the house, the, the garage and breezeway have not been stripped yet. Thank God, actually. It's kind of a good thing. Otherwise, I'd have a problem. And I'll get the Miata back in here at some point. That'll be a nice time. Get this thing put in here. Store it for good. And uh, I can't wait to do that. Alright, I'm going to go back in the house. It's cold.